I'm going to change gears in talking about uh, trying to come up with a catchy title again, mulling over nanomotions, uh, and especially the molecular assembly that's there. But I'm going to back up a little bit as an introduction and give you some sense of, of why we want to be doing something like this, is studying these strange little beasts. So the oil-water interface of which these nanomotions are comprised um, have been interest to scientists and non-scientists for a long time. And Benjamin Franklin, in particular, was enamored by the fact that, or curi found very curious, that when he would float across the Atlantic on ships, he would notice in the flotilla that the water, the sea behind one of the boats, was much calmer than the rest of the boats. And that boat tended to be the Cook's Galley. <laughs> and the reason was because they'd throw all the slop uh, over the side of the boat, and those oils then would calm the seas. And he was fascinated by this, uh, and so fascinated that when he returned back to Britain, he was known for walking through the countryside with a cane with a little vial of oil on it, and when he saw a pristine lake with maybe some waves on it, he would pour it on the lake to see how it would calm the waves. Now these days we would probably get arrested for that, but in those days he thought it was pretty cool. And in fact, it, was, it took uh, Rayleigh a hundred years later to do that related experiment to look at how far that oil layer spread to get the size of a molecule and run the Nobel Prize for that. But I think Benjamin Franklin has enough rep good reputation behind him. He didn't need that one also. But it's, it's, it's been very curious. Uh, this observation then led to even more people trying to understand this. And we know now that sailors have actually uh, and long ago used this method of calming the seas by putting oil on the water, particularly when the seas were rough and they were trying to land. But this oil versus, when it meets water, you know, we've all heard the saying that, that oil and water either hate each other or they don't want to mix. And so the curiosity about the oil-water interface it still continues to be there and up until recently largely been understood by theoretical work. And so, but the, it's really important to understand how water's next to hydrophobic surface, whether it be your lava lamp, is that dating me? Are we into retro now? Um, <laughs> or whether there be some kind of a, a disaster with regards to an oil spill or paints or soap. You know, all of these paints and co cosmetics and, and soaps are all have to do with emulsions, creating emulsions that, um, that are stable or, or not stable. But something that's come to uh, interest, much interest to me more recently uh, with regards to oil-water interfaces is because we've been worried on trying to understand the molecular nature of what happens when water gets next to oil. But it became particularly relevant when I attended uh, a Gulf conference, uh, one of the research conferences, where BP has put money into trying to do research on oil spill cleanup as a result of the Horizon oil spill. And that even made it more, I felt, even more important for us to be doing what we were doing. And so I was invited to come and give a talk at this meeting because a lot of the people there were cleaning up birds and, you know, trying to come up with different kinds of chemicals that could clean up the, the oil spill, but they didn't really have a chemical molecular understanding of what was going on so they could start to predict if they put a different kind of uh, uh, cleanup uh, system on the surfactant why it might work or not work. And so I came in to give this very molecular level uh, picture, which uh, many people valued. But what I valued was I got the bigger picture of what happens with an oil spill. And some of you may know this, but I'm just going to say a few words because it motivates what I'm going to tell you about. From a very fundamental level, we're not cleaning up oil spills, but we're trying to do, generate this kind of predictive knowledge. And so when you have an oil spill, there's, there's uh, several different ways in which they tend to clean up the oil spill. And one of them is to do dispersants, so that's chemical dispersants that you spray on top of the oil. And the whole idea is to get that oil to break up into tiny little droplets that then can be washed off to sea or actually can be eaten by microbes to get and, and go away. Some of it, though, does end up on the bottom of the ocean, too. However, the, it's bad enough with the oil. We've seen the, the, the das disastrous things that happen when the oil gets on plants and animals and so forth. But the dispersant itself, the most common dispersant that's used is something that's called Corexit. And Corexit was invented decades ago, kind of a magic formula that nobody really knew what was in it until somebody broke into the 
intellectual safe and put the components on the web. This corrects it does do a very good job of breaking up this oil spill into little tiny particulates. However, it's incredibly toxic. But not because it's one chemical, it's actually a soup of different chemicals, some which are safe and some which are not safe. But the good thing is it can apply to an oil slick that's very thick, thick oil or light oil, but it's just very toxic. And so coming up with dispersants, the holy grail in this field is to come up with a dispersant that actually can break up the oil spill, but can also be very safe. That's the holy grail. Now, there are other ways to clean up an oil spill. One of them would be burning. And so in that case, of course, you're just burning the oil off the top. And you might say that this is like a big fish fry. <laughs> but in actual fact, the oil is pretty thin on the top layer. So the amount of heat that it generates is, is pretty low. But it also means that you get a tremendous amount of toxic smoke that comes off. And then uh, and another one is to do skimming. And in this case, what you're doing if, is try to concentrate the oil spill into one particular area that might be further away from the shore or a distance away, and then burning it once you've concentrated with these booms. These little booms are, are kind of big, big uh, links hooked together that then uh, pull the water together. You can see the links around that for the, that's the burn that's going on there. The problem is, though, that each of those links is hundreds of thousands of dollars. So burning, you end up burning the links, too, the, the booms, too. And so that's not a great solution, either. So even though none of these solutions seem to be good, except for let's get rid of, <laughs> let's just stop uh, offshore drilling or whatever you want to do, but that's not going to happen. Uh, and so we've got to figure out some way to clean up that oil. And so it really uh, even drew me further trust being taking our study more towards nanomotions and emulsions in general, and particularly for understanding how these different kinds of surfactants might interact at the surface. So from an environmental perspective, um, and the skimming is, is basically related to skimming the oil together. So going back to what we think about really water and oil on a fundamental level, how it behaves is important not only for thinking even about how, how ions transport across a membrane or how water behaves next to a membrane, because basically your body is all oil-water interfaces, right? You're just glad that your hands aren't the water part, <laughs> so you can wash them. Um, but also the fact, but, so it's very important to be able to understand that interaction between the two. And then also for chemistry, I don't know if you do this demonstration here in your organic chemistry class where you make nylon. Yeah, yeah, right, and you pull the nylon out and pretend like it's useful, not really, <laughs> right? Uh, but still, it's a, it's a cool demo. And so that interface then acts as a kind of a catalyst for making that polymer. And then, uh, but also, um, super hydrophobic surfaces are a big deal in technology. This goes far beyond your Teflon pan, more hydrophobic than that. But again, understanding what's happening to water when it gets near there uh, is of great fundamental interest, and that's where, where we've been working. So I'm going to focus on uh, three questions. First of all, what have we learned uh, over the years about what happens when water gets next to oil, um, this hydrophobic liquid next to the hydrophilic uh, liquid? And then secondly, uh, how do these properties, once we've learned that on a molecular level, then how do these properties influence how stuff goes there, whether it be surfactants or polymers and, and so forth? I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then uh, the most recent work, which we've been doing, is to really understand now, this, the qu second question is for systems where we're using just a planar interface, just a planar oil-water interface. And we've always kind of presumed that that planar would be a good representation of what would happen at a droplet surface. And so now we want to be able to build on the technique that we use to be able to then do the kind of studies we do at a planar interface at these spherical droplet interfaces to also understand what stabilizes something into a droplet, what are the molecular factors that stabilize it, but also how do the properties of that surface change as you turn it into a, into a ball. So the techniques that we uh, use, some of you here are, are familiar with the first one, which is vibrational sum frequency spectroscopy. Uh, for those of you who are not, let me do a little bit of a background. And these are for the planar studies. And what we do is take a, a tunable infrared beam, visible beam, put them on the interface. And they then, by tuning the infrared beam, it then generates a spectrum of the molecules at the surface. Why two beams? 
because this process of being able to make sure that the spectroscopy, the vibrational spectroscopy we get from the surface, is only from the surface on very much a molecular level, you've got to have these two laser beams, a nonlinear effect, which kicks in. And so this way, we're probing molecules that are within 10 angstrom for an ideal system, around 10 angstroms in the interfacial region, right there at the top. Whereas if you were doing regular FTIR as reflecting, just taking a single IR beam and reflecting it off the surface, it's going to penetrate hundreds of angstroms down into the water. And that's going to then, the bulk is going to completely dwarf what we have at the surface. So that's why we go this uh, nonlinear method for doing this. But a couple of other things. First of all, in order for us to get a signal, you must have broken inversion symmetry. So, symmetry, so what's above much looks different than below. So if you're in the bulk of the water, What's above looks like what's below, but if you're right at the junction, the water doesn't look like the oil below, and then you will be able to generate this vibrational spectroscopy. Second is if we're going to see anybody there, they have to be aligned. Uh, they have to have alignment there. And so they have to have a net orientation. So if everything at the interface is completely random, so everything cancels each other out in terms of the orientation, we're not going to see it. But we're going to see it if there's alignment, which is there. And that's an important point to make, too. So then I, later I'll go to the droplet surfaces. In this case, it's basically the same principles. In this case, you're, you're scattering the light off a tiny droplet and collecting the, uh, the light. The top experiment is difficult. The bottom experiment is even more difficult because it's a scattering geometry. Uh, I also should say that the selection rules for the vibrational spectroscopy, you've, t you've heard about modes being Raman or infrared active. In this case, for us to see them, they both be both Raman and infrared active. But that's m more details. And I'll, I'll talk about this as we go. But uh, as cool as this technique is, there are some weaknesses. And for example, one of the weaknesses which uh, we think a lot about is the fact that you can't quantify, I can't tell you how many molecules that corresponds to. It's not like Beer's law. And so what we have to do to figure out how much stuff is there that we're getting a signal from when, you, when we put surfactants or polymers there, we do surface tension measurements. And the surface tension measurements then of the top there, we do it in a droplet configuration or a Langmuir trough, that tells us how, much, how, much th how many things are absorbed at the interface, because as things absorb the interface, the surface tension goes down. And then we're able to do an analysis of how much material is there and then correlate that with the spectrum. Then we also do the zeta potential measurements allow us to understand what the charge on a droplet is. And we can also then do light scattering, which allows us to figure out how big the droplets are. So those are more for the droplet uh, studies. But again, again, another, and so that helps us in ways of some frequency count. But the other one that's really important is that we, the spectroscopy is complicated. And unlike uh, something like a, taken a, like an FTIR, you can start to point at peaks and say, this is a peak, so it corresponds to this, this, and this. But with some frequency, because it's actually a, a nonlinear coherent process, you get interferences between modes. And so just because you see a peak doesn't necessarily mean a brand new peak. It may be because it's interfering with somebody else that went down and up and so forth. So we have to do spectral fitting in order to figure out when we have a, one kind of a peak or another. And then also there's some other complications with regards to interferences. So what we do with, because so, so that we can uh, do a good job of figuring out what corresponds to peaks, is we then do molecular dynamics and DFT calculations to calculate a spectrum and without any inputs, just simply MD simulations and then calculating a spectrum. And if that matches with the spectrum that we measure, that allows us then to go back into looking at the MD picture and figure out what molecules correspond to different peaks in the simulations. The other advantage of that is, in addition to being able to assign peaks, now, OK, I, honest Abe, I'm not a card-carrying theorist, OK? So we do this with uh, collaborations, and we largely do it in our group now. But I have to also admit that I've always been very skeptical of computational work. And so this makes me comfortable because it allows us to verify the computational work and uh, to be able to feel better about our assignments, but also about the computational work. OK, but the other thing is that with these interfaces, we'd like to also be able to know what's happening at one angstrom, five angstroms down, 10 angstroms down, 15 angstroms down. 
And the signal from our, uh, for many of our experiments is just mostly in the 10 angstrom region. But we want to know depth profiling, and we can't do that with these laser beams. But the MD simulations allow us then to go and say, well, you know, it's happening in the second layer down or third layer down. This is important, as I'll show you in just a minute. Okay, so let me go on now. So in our first, the first studies and continue to do in this area have to do with now taking the simplest oil you can find from a spectroscopic, spectroscopic perspective, and that's carbon tetrachloride. And so this is really easy to get the infrared beams through because in this case we take the infrared beam through the, the oil layer. But this is a spectrum that we've obtained for water. This is what water looks like at the carbon tat water interface. Okay? Nice sharp peak and then a couple of broad blobs. That's really spectroscopic, spectroscopic terms. <laughs> um, so, but the sharp peak is, and the sharp peak is very interesting. So I'm going to tell you about now. But first of all, this is the water spectrum. This is the OH stretch modes of water. And at the far end at 3800 would be, or this sharp peak here, is when water doesn't bond at all or very little to other water molecules. And the far end is the red shift is when you start to see tetrahedral kind of bonding. So, you know, three water molecules bound together tetrahedral. Okay, so let's go a little bit deeper in that. So if I have then a picture of this water interface, what this sharp peak corresponds to here is what many of us call the free OH, or you can call the dangling OH, OH bond. And that bond is for water molecules. It's a single peak. And that's because those are water molecules that got the oil on the, on the bottom. That's one OH goes into the oil and one OH goes into the water. Is that like too weird? I mean, when you think about it, you've got these guys straddling the interface kind of doing this, OK? So they're aligned, and that's why we see them. And quite interestingly, the frequency of this, and you, you also see this at an air-water interface also. So think about that when you're drinking your glass of water. There's these OHs sticking up at you, <laughs> OK? So it's a little freaky, huh? So, um, so uh, but the point is that this, that's what we find, we can get a frequency for the OH going into the air. Nothing's bonded to it. But when you get the frequency of this guy, it shows that the water is bound to the organic. So you know, and if you look at some of the biochem texts, they suggest that when water gets next to oil, they form a clathrate. They don't have anything to do with water, or do they have anything to do with the oil? And then uh, work by uh, David Chandler uh, suggested that actually when you have oil next to water, you've got a vacuum region, so they stay far away from each other. When in actual fact, this shows that there is a weak interaction, sort of a, a dispersion type of bonding, so very weak but there is bonding between the oil and the water. And you'll see that's really important for what we're going to talk about at the interface. So what about these other peaks? So these other peaks correspond, this is now water bonded in the interface, oriented, bonding to just one or two other water molecules. It's largely that other OH that goes into the water phase. And then you go a little bit deeper. Now we're going deeper into the, they still have to be aligned, but you have some net orientation of water that's more strongly bonded to other water molecules, more getting closer to ice-like. Uh, water. Okay, so that's what the interface looks like at, for an oil-water interface. But is this general? Is this general? Well, so what we did in discovering this was we decided to well let's change the oil phase to see if water still likes some of our other hydrophobic media, and this frequency then at the top is the vapor water interface frequency, so no bonding. And then I brought down here carbon tet water. Now carbon tet is polarizable, and so you can get a bond associated with that. But what about when you put a fluorocarbon, like a Teflon there? Is water going to bond to that? And sure enough, here we have the fluorocarbon films we did on silica. Uh, you find that the OH peak is there. It's just weak. It's a little bit stronger bonded than, it's got some bonding to it, but not nearly as strong as the carbon tet. And then you just put all kinds of hexanes, different, uh, and also monolayers. They all come in at 3674. So this, you see this progression of very, very weak to stronger uh, bonding, but still, remember, it's still sort of London dispersion forces. And then you get to something that's got a little bit of polarity to it, and the, again, it gets a little bit stronger, and you go too much stronger, and you've lost the interface because they become soluble in one another. So we could see this trend of this bonding and confirm that this was actually the case. Okay, so what we've learned then is there's weak bonding interaction between water and the oil. I, sorry, I flipped the oil and the water just to make sure you're paying attention. <laughs> and uh, and then, uh, then we have a high degree of molecular orientation. So there's a field that's there at the interface because of this, this way the polarity is set up. 
And then these the interfacial interactions go from weak to stronger as you go down, with the depth being about 10 angstroms. After 10 angstroms into the water, then everything becomes random. We get that from the MD simulations. And so what this means is that orientation sets up a field at the interface that's pretty tight, but it does send up a field at the interface that can draw things in, and we've done a bunch of studies to look at how ions can be drawn into that interface, very different than, for example, an air-water interface for a bunch of different ions that we've done. So that's what we've learned, but now the question becomes, who cares and why? So how does this different structure than people had presumed at the oil-water interface affect stuff going there? So now we're going to do the stuff going there. See, let me show you what we've learned. Okay, so let's start out first with, uh, we've done a bunch of different surfactants, but I'm going to start with cheap soap, with carboxylic acid soap. You know, uh, for all of you that really are concerned about bathtub ring, <laughs> yeah, a lot of concern here, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, have, it's calcium bonding to cheap carboxylic acids. They tend to be, it's cheap soap, carboxylic acids easy and soap. And, they, they, and in this case, we've been studying the carboxylic acid. This, I'm not going to talk any more about bathtub ring. But what I am going to say is what we find some very interesting behavior with the carboxylic acid that give you an example of what we learn with the other surfactants. This is now looking at the head group of the carboxylic acid. So it's the carboxylate when it's deprotonated. And what we have here then is the some frequency response for this mode. Let's see if I can do this right. Okay, and what you see is, and this is as a function of pH, and we have the, I've got polarization PPP, so we're, pol we're looking at primarily modes perpendicular to the interface, but PPP has other elements too. Anyway, just think of perpendicular to the interface. But what you find is you're picking up those, that head group modes, showing that the head group is aligned at the interface, the head group is nicely aligned, but it's got two peaks rather than one. And that has told us that the carboxylic acid actually is solvated in two different ways, and that and also causes it to orient differently and give different frequencies. And so that it's more complex than some might be, and you'll see that in, in a moment. Uh, but most important, I want you to pay attention, is to the pH. So as you lower the pH to where it becomes protonated, you don't see a signal from the surfactant being there. Okay, so you could, you could say, well, okay, it's gone. The, what happens is once it becomes protonated, it completely goes off of the interface. That's why you don't see a signal there. And that's what we first concluded. It's there when it's deprotonated and it's uh, and gone when it's protonated. But then we did the MD simulations, and what we found out was actually it is there, but it's just not oriented, and that's why we don't see it. And so it's kind of laying around there. And in the last few weeks, we've been thinking a lot about this with the nanomotion studies. And the reason we think that the charge is so important, because the charge in those first few uh, uh, layers of the uh, alkane help to orient it. And they orient the first part of the head grid. They help orient it. If the charge is not there, they can just flop all over. But that's more details than you need. But it's just that we obsess over s tiny details. So, um, but I want to keep going with this because we then look at the CH modes of the chains and we find, and so this is why I told you that the specter can be really ugly. So this is a specter that only a mother could love, <laughs> I tell you, right? Um, and because it's, it's good, strong signal, this is actually the carbon tet water uh, interface. This is a free OH and then this gets down into the, some other modes. But uh, these are the, this is the water bands CHs, and when you put the charge at the interface, the water bands go crazy because you're orienting water really deep into the water, so you just get all buckets of water that you're detecting rather than just this 10 angstrom region. And, but then the simpler thing, but what you can see is that, uh, again, as before, carboxylic acid, uh, the surfactant is there when it's deprotonated and then off when it becomes protonated. But then, so those are the CH modes, those are the water modes. You do add D2O to that, you get water the bands, and you can study the, the CH modes. Okay, so the big picture of this for, that we get for these particular surfactants, the head group there, kind of oriented uh, with different levels of salvation, uh, so not strictly oriented when, one way. And there's also, uh, and a lot of salvation, but also the chains, looking at the CH modes, we're able to, and I'll talk a little bit about this later, the CH modes are quite disordered there. So you don't have strong hydrophobic interactions between the chains like you sometimes see with SAMS uh, monolayers. There's quite a bit of, of disorder. Okay, so that's, and so we've done, you know, a lot of, as I put there, a lot of different uh, surfactants. Um, 
For those of you, you know, really are bored tonight, go look to see where you have sulfates and sulfonates in your home products. <laughs> and you will learn that your shampoo, I think, is sulfonate, sulfates and your toothpaste is sulfonates. So just think, if you run out of toothpaste, That was cheap. Okay, so, um, so now, okay, so now we're going to do the experiment. We're going to tie up the tails. When I say tie up the tails, so we're going to take that surfactant and we're going to put it into a polymer. Basically, now we're going to take a polymer and we're going to put carboxylic acid groups on it. So we want to see now what happened when you add this hydrophobicity of a polymer to those uh, charged head groups. And so what do we know about, and this is polyacrylic acid, wonderful uh, polymer used in a variety of different applications. Um, including diapers, and we won't go into de detail why that's the case, but you can only guess because it does absorb 200 times its weight in uh, liquids. And so what you have in, if you look in bulk of what's happening in bulk, you find that when it's at a very low pH, like I showed you before where it was off the interface or quite disordered, in the bulk solution it's also very disordered, but when it becomes charged, it strings out. And you know, so you know what you're seeing with, the, but again, this is a polymer. And so in these experiments, and what we've been doing is looking at now both the carboxylic acid mode and, and the carboxylate mode. We did that before with the surfactant, but I didn't talk about it. And then we also look at the CH backbone modes. And we wanted to see if the polymer goes to the interface, and if it does, does it act like the surfactant does? Does it act like the surfactant in going there when it's protonated and uh, deprotonated and off when it's uh, protonated? And see if we can see anything at all. So. What do you think? How many vote for, oh, you have to be really outgoing now. How many of you vote for that the polymer is going to go there? Given what I've got there, what happens in bulk? The polymer is going to go there when it's charged. Polymer is going to go there when it's uncharged, when it's protonated. Polymer never goes there. But I quit the talk. Oh, he's just playing with his hands down here. I'm going to say, Steve, you think I'm done with my talk now? So you know that one was wrong. Okay. Here's the answer. It does. It does go to the interface, but only when it's protonated. So all you protonators win. OK. And you pick up in this, and so, but you see, it's only there at a pH less than 4. And if actually, it comes off, I'll show you in a minute, it comes off at pH of 4.5. It's on, and then boom, it's off. But it's in, this is the, the carboxylic acid mode. It's just one single sharp peak, so that baby's just really aligned when the polymer's at the interface, like a deer in headlights. And then, but, and the CH modes, the CH modes of the backbone are incredibly aligned also. You can see the CH modes stacking up like soldiers on the backbone of this polymer at this interface. Is that like way too cool? It's way too cool. What a mother would love. So, um, and so this is now doing that same pH-dependent study that I showed you with the, car with the surfactants. But interestingly, I want you to note that pH 1.5 to 4, you get this signal. 4.5 to 10, nothing. So it doesn't, so hint as we're going ahead. This signal doesn't change in intensity whether you're at 1.5, 2.0, 2.5, 3.0, 3 3.5, even though the equilibrium is going to be favoring deprotonation as you get closer to 4. OK, so we're going there, too. And so this is actually the kind of the titration curve. It's on, and then it's off. But it's there only when it becomes protonated. So with this whole, the whole series of experiments we've done, what we've, and so it comes back to, actually, it actually comes back to this guy. Why is the intensity of the change? Why does it look as if there's the same amount of polymer there, regardless of whether you change the pH between 1.5 and 4? Another uh, piece of evidence that came into the answering that question is that no matter if we took, so these polymers are going to go to the interface over time, you know, it's just a few minutes. But if you take the signal in the first 20 seconds, you can see that I'm doing surface tension. If you didn't know what that was about, that was surface <laughs> tension. And so if you, no matter if you make the measurement at the first 20 seconds or three minutes where the surface tension goes down, the signal is the same. It doesn't change. And so what the picture that we've derived from this is that first layer, because it's got a field there, goes down. That field orients the polymer beautifully. But then you've kind of canceled out that field, and the rest of the layers go down because of hydrophobic interactions, and they're not aligned. And so even though you've got polymer building up there, 
We don't see it because our technique doesn't pull up the, the, those that are randomly oriented. And, that's, and we've been able to show that with other experiments too, different sizes and so forth. But then the other curious thing is, uh, about this is why, is why that it has this very sharp fall off. Why does it have this very sharp fall off? Let me see if I've got an, what's this cause this sharp pH? change. And so we looked into the, and so we did polymethyl acrylic acid just because it, uh, just because we could, but it has the same properties basically as PAA. But what we did then was we took different chain lengths of polymer. And the reason that we did this was because in the literature you found out, you can find out that actually when it's in the, in solution it also has this strange pH behavior. And what's happening, and I'm going to show you what, uh, what's going on here. So what's happening is that you have collective behavior, you have collective dissociation. And so once you get on the polymer, once you get one charge that becomes deprotonated, it influences the one next to each other, and you, start, you have these groups of it, parts of the polymer that become charged, they influence each other. I call it the air, airport effect. Maybe I spend too much time at airports. Because you, you know, you, you, everybody's, nobody's getting in line yet. Nobody's getting in line yet. And then you turn to get a drink of water and you come back and everybody's in line and you're stuck on the very end of the line. Because everybody figures out at the same time to do it together. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've been at airports too much. So, but the whole point is that this collective behavior, what we believe is going on is as you change the pH to where they're starting to get deprotonation, then you have pieces of the polymer that become charged, which then become solvated in the water and then they pull up into the, into the water and they're away from the interface. And so that paper is called Chunks of Charge. <laughs> That's the title. Okay. But anyway, it's just a really cool, and, and Ellen Robertson, who did this work, is, really needs to be credit for this. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about uh, even more recent work, and that has to do with these nano emulsion surfaces. So take these planar and, and put them into a droplet. And so uh, in this case, trying to understand for a regular emulsion where you have oil in the middle, uh, water on the outside versus reverse water in the middle, oil on the outside. We want to be able to understand how surfactants absorb at this interface, how they orient, just like we talked about at the planar interface. But also for nano emulsions or for emulsions in general, you know, um, you need to have a surfactant, generally believed, you need to have a surfactant there in order to stabilize the droplet. Okay, and so you know if you have uh, you know if your lotions have very strong stabilizers to make the emulsion stay as an emulsion for a long time, but your your uh, vinegar and oil or some of your cheap salad dressings that separate the emulsifier or the stabilizer just isn't as strong to last for a long time. But understanding what factors contribute to stabilization of that nano emulsion is what one of the key things that we've been after. And so now we want to be able to do the spectroscopy there. And many people have done beautiful experiments on micelles. Mike Fayer is, is a good example. My cells are, are much smaller. So water inside becomes confined, and that becomes a, much, a very interesting issue of what happens when water is confined in these tiny micelles. But these nano emulsions are a lot bigger. I'm going to talk about three, four, five hundred uh, nanometers. And that's because the technique is tuned towards, uh, towards that size with, with the optics. And that means the droplet's pretty big. In fact, if, and you know, my question in the beginning was, if you're on the nano emulsion, when does the earth look flat? You know, so at what point does, does your neighbor, you know, does a neighbor seem like it's, you're right next to each other like on a planar interface? And so you'll, I'll talk a bit about that too. Okay, so these initial studies have been done with AOT. And why did we choose AOT? One of the reasons is because it's one of the major components in Corexit. But it's also in ice cream. <laughs> So, you know, so don't worry, don't worry. Uh, it's safe, okay? It's safe, but it's not safe when you mix it with all the other stuff that they, and solvents and so forth that they put in. So it's just, but we'd wanted to be able just to understand AOT uh, by itself. And so in this case, we've been able, and the other nice thing about this is AOT has been studied with my cells, not with some frequency, but been set so we can at least compare issues. But also AOT, it's kind of unusual to have a surfactant that will stabilize both regular and reverse nano emulsions. So that way we could look at, for example, what happens to the head groups if the tails are going in, or the tails, or the tails are going out. And so in these really early studies in this field, that's what the kind of issues that we've been going after. And let me, let me go back to this to say that Sylvie Roque, has really pioneered this work in the last number of years. So we largely build on her, uh, her experimental uh, setup. 
Okay, so this is a spectrum after. Let me just say for the carbon, I should back up for a minute. The planar studies are hard. The optical planar studies are hard. They're mostly hard. It took us two years to get that carbon tet water spectrum. And it, the spectroscopy was one thing, but the fact that if you have any impurities in either your oil or your water, they go to the interface. And that completely screws up the water spectrum. You get huge water bands and the free OH goes away. Okay? And so uh, cleaning up the solvents was really hard. And so it took us, doing all the planar, it took us about three years to get these optics set up to where we could actually do these nanomulsion uh, experiments. This is then the CH backbone modes of this AOT. And these are the CH modes, and I'm just going to point them out. This is the symmetric stretch CH2. So this is the CH2s, the symmetric stretch. This is the CH3, and we have to do fitting to actually get intensity values for these different modes. CH3 symmetric stretch. And these two, and then you get Fermi resonances further down in other modes there. Uh, but these two modes are particularly important because when people are doing, looking at monolayers and, and so forth, they take a ratio, and particularly for some frequency, they take a ratio of the methyl modes to the methylene to get some parameter associated with order. So let me explain why. If you have, a, 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 for this some frequency, if you have these chains that are beautifully aligned next to each other, you're going to see the CH3 mode because it's going to be aligned. And this, but you're not going to see the CH2 backbone modes because these they each cancel each other out. Okay, so you're not going to see those. So when you see very low CH2 signal, it tells you that the, the chains are actually pretty well oriented. Not perfect if it's still there, but uh, you, so you do the ratio of the CH3 to CH2. And so in this particular case, we've got the D plus and the, the R plus, you just get a number associated with this ratio. This actually is considerable disorder, but I'll show you what it means when we go to the other planar surfaces too. So now this is a comparison of all three for those modes and then the, the ratio. And what we find if we study these regular reverse and, and planar, what you find is actually there's much more alkyl disordering at the droplet interface than there is at the planar. So you might, that might suggest that the chains just don't see each other very much or they just don't become very ordered at all. And interestingly, I, uh, I've always thought that all the information in studying the surfactant assembly, would, all the action would be in the head group. But in actual fact, when I showed this data recently, someone said that, well, actually, our nanomulsions, we make different kinds of spherical versus droplet nanomulsions, and it's all based on the tails. So they said, actually, the tails are more important. As a dog lover, I always thought that the head group was probably <laughs> more important, not the tail. Depends on your dog, I guess. So I thought, well, what about the head group? So the tails show there's some disorder, <laughs> but what about the head group? And so with AOT, and again, these are really, there's only a few people in the world able to do these experiments, and these are the first ones that are done with, um, with a molecule that's a, a complex like this. I also should have said that um, for doing these parameters, you know my AOTs were, um, weren't just straight chained, and, that's, and the reason is that we've gone with that system. It's a little more complicated, but the ratios still give us the same information. So. Just wanted to put in that qualifier. Okay, so with AOT, we wanted to see how that head group mode looked. And so this is now the sulfonate head group spectrum, one peak. And we find it's highly oriented at the droplet interface, highly oriented, and it also has a high degree of solvation. The frequency just tells us that. So we can see it, it's highly oriented. But what about now, we wanted to see what happened as you change the parameters in that head group, and basically to change the cation in the head group. And in that case, what you see is different signals, basically the same spectral feature, but different signals if you have sodium, potassium, uh, magnesium. And what you see then is the magnesium is very strong, uh, but also the particle size changes as you do the different ions. But when you normalize for that, you still find out that the magnesium uh, signal is much stronger. So let's see how that compares. In this case, we can only do reverse nanomotions in the planar. Okay, and what you see is the, the frequency is exactly the same place, whether it's planar or it's uh, spherical. But you do see that, as with the alkyl chains, um, you do see that it's a different bandwidth with regards to the planar versus the uh, spherical. But that's because it's just a different laser system. This is with the short pico, this is a short picosecond laser, and this is a femtosecond laser, and you used to have different bandwidths. But otherwise, the properties look very similar. The magnesium is, is very high. And so what we've, we've con concluded with regards to that head group and why the magnesium is so different is in the following picture. 
So what's happening is that with sodium, so they're all nicely aligned, but the magnesium tightly binds to that sulfonate head group, and therefore it doesn't orient the water around it as well, but it allows that, killing that repulsive interaction between the chains. That means the magnesium AOT can pack a lot tighter versus sodium and potassium where it's, you can, uh, it doesn't have as much shielding with those ions and therefore there's a lot more uh, repulsive interaction so they just can't pack as tightly. But to be able to use that kind of reasoning to be able to understand this specter is really cool because it means maybe what you learned in chemistry was right or useful or your research was right and useful. Okay, so, but what how about this droplet size? You know, when does the earth look flat? So what we did then was to, if you have these droplets and you, over time, they're going to flo flocculate and then coalesce, and then your oil and water sepa eventually separate. So we want, and so this is just now the, for reverse emulsions, this is now the size with, uh, size as a function of age, time, in terms of days. And so we wanted to see if the spectra changed as these, uh, the size got bigger. And they, we found out it really didn't. The alkyl chains really doesn't. The alkyl chains say disordered. They don't show this kind of ordering versus a little more disordering. They're basically almost identical when you go from 500 to 200 angstroms. So what we think with these nano emulsions is happening for this size, that you don't have a lot of interactions between the chains, but there's something about the, the chains that are, could be involved in stabilization of those uh, nano emulsions. So uh, these, in these first measurements of AOT, we've been able to provide new insights about what sta these nanomotions, what their structure is. It's a long ways to go yet. We find the planar interface, more alkyl chain ordering, uh, and the cation binding also significantly influences the surfactant degree, but not so much the alkyl ordering. What we've been doing in the last several months is, I didn't think I had time to put this in, but I just want to give you a picture of what's going on. As I said, so understanding solvent uh, emulsion stabilization is really important. And since 1861, where nanoemulsions or even droplets in the water droplets in the air have been created, they found to always have a negative charge on them. And so a number of people, a fellow in Australia called Beatty, has believed that has been able to, met, to take these nano droplets, found that they have a zeta potential, a negative charge, let's, I'll just say a number, of minus 55 millivolts. And Silly Roki, who's done this pioneering work, has also been able to, uh, for bare nanomotions, bare nanomotions, nothing there. You can make them, and they find it at the negative charge. And Silly Roki has done similar measurements with some frequency to show um, that these bare nanomotions have a negative charge, but she also said there's no free OH. So we said, if there's no, remember I did carbon tet, that sharp peak? She said there's no free OH at a nanomotion surface. So, you know, my first thought with the nanomotion, what experimentry should do, is like, find the free OH. I mean, if it's really bare, the free OH should be there, based on what we know. Because once stuff goes to the interface, it ties up the free OH. You know, it's out there hanging around waiting for somebody to come, and so it ties it up. And so what we did, because we're so good at cleaning solvents, was we got, we were able to make, for the first time, nanomotions that have zero to minus five millivolts, not 55, not 60, not 80. And so, and they have a free OH. But the downside of this is we've been able to make them because we've gotten rid of all the impurities. And we've done that, for those of you that worry about impurities in your, when you do whatever you're doing, we found out that putting the, the water in even doubly distilled, you know, deionized water in a glass, in a glass <laughs> that hasn't been clean, in plastic, I should say, in plastic, you get the impurities. Nanomolar impurities, that's the level that we worry about. So don't worry about drinking water out of a plastic jar, okay, it's okay. It's, it's low, but enough that it screws us up. And, but then, when you're cleaning your glassware, we use an acid bath. So you put your glassware into the clean acid bath, you take it out, you take another and do the experiment, works great, but you do the second experiment using that same acid bath and you screwed the experiment up. So that's the that was allowed us to go from 55, minus 55 millivolts to minus 30 with plastic, just plastic in our procedures, to minus 5 when you did the acid bath carefully. 
So that's what, we're, that's what we're working on now, is to try to understand these bare nanomotions. To go back to what I told you was these planar interface studies with the free OH. Okay, so finishing this up, AOT solvonate head group, highly solvated, exists a strong orientation of the interfacial water. But I guess I should also say the punchline for these neat uh, studies, remember I told you that water and oil weakly bond to each other? It's stronger at the nanomotion surface. So that frequency is red shifted at the nanomotion surface, which suggests that it could be a factor in stabilizing these otherwise supposed to be non-stable nanomotions. Okay, so in summary, I've provided you uh, some ideas of the unique opportunities we've had in studying these interfaces, the surfactants, the polymers. I didn't talk about peptoids. We've done peptoids before. And then also uh, looking at how that relates to the nanomotion surface. And let me finish up with the most important slide, and that is uh, some of the group back home, although they're, this is not the weather back home right now. <laughs> Um, and so uh, I particularly want to point out Andrew up here, who's done the bare nanomotion studies, as well as Emma, uh, who's been involved in this. Regina and Brandon, a lot of our polymer work at the nanomotion interface. Jen Hensel was the postdoc that set up the uh, nanomotion uh, optics, and has gone on to uh, real employment. And then uh, Regina, who is, uh, has done a lot of that. Regina's done a lot of that. Bree does a lot of our computational work. We do a lot of atmospheric studies at air water interface. She's done a lot of that. Fred Moore is this angel that shows up from Whitman College and physics department faculty every summer and just hangs out and, and tells us what we need to do next. He does a lot with our molecular dynamics simulations. It's just a real wonderful to have him uh, here. And then Nick Valley started us off with a lot of the uh, computational work too. Clive has done a lot of the, um, back here has done a lot of the oil water studies too. Uh, Priscilla uh, is my assistant who runs my coach program back home and then makes sure everybody feels like there's a mom there when I'm here. So she's wonderful with the group and the others have been involved in our uh, air water studies. So, and, and funding from uh, basic energy sciences of DOE and early studies from NSF. So I want to thank you all for paying attention uh, in this <coughs> late afternoon and for coming. What a treat it's been to be here. I was here years ago when we all looked a little different, <laughs> a little younger. Uh, but it's such a treat to be back here with Steve and Julie and all of your colleagues and all of your students. So thank you very much, and I'd welcome any questions. Vibrational, vibrational spectrum. Yeah, could you go oh my gosh, all the way back. Of um, which one that I showed? Which one do you want? Oh, any? Tell me to stop when you want me to stop. No, keep going. But I like that one better. <laughs> there? No. The first one on my equipment slide? Yeah. This one? Yeah. Okay. So, like, maybe my, um, my understanding is limited on this, but I would normally, so you said this peak is like the isolated uh, oil. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I would normally expect the isolated one to be like the initial big peak and the... Oh, that, that, the isolated one is this one. Is the free OH? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can you explain why we have the isolated peak like uh, at around uh, that frequency? Yeah, that frequency. Because I would expect the isolated peak to be first, and then the peaks would like gradually decrease up as it would have like more interaction. So, so okay. So this is the, f the free OH, that's the one that's isolated by itself. And the reason that it has, it's only one peak rather than two, the symmetric and the asymmetric stretch, is because w as this OH goes into the water, this goes into the carbon tetra, the air, that this energy of this frequency, this peak is shifted so f much further to the red, so they become, un become uncoupled. So now they're uncoupled modes, because otherwise you would see a double peak. Okay, and so a as you then add more bonding, then the water molecules further down, actually are water molecules that are in the, most of them are in the plane of the surface, are about five degrees off axis. The ones that are about two or three angstroms down are more like this, and they're bonded in this way. 
And then uh, as you go further, a uh, little bit down, they're bonded more in uh, three and four water molecules, and that's what you get down deeper. Okay, so okay, does that so help? Could we have like any, any other, uh, any other like oil with water where we would have the initial peak, uh, like the isolated peak, and then the, the other peak? Set so the isolated water, H2O, I mean the, the isolated asymmetric and symmetric stretch of water? Yeah. Isolated? Ah, good question. Yeah. We did that one, and I didn't say it. It's actually right about here, and it's water monomers that go into the oil. So you have water molecules. So the field into the water layer is about 10 angstrom. The field into the oil layer goes about 17 angstroms for carbon tet. And so what's happening is the water goes in. Within 17 angstroms, it stays oriented. And so what, you, what you're talking about uh, is that isolated water is right here. Now, what we were looking for for air water was we were looking for maybe some peaks out here that might just be kind of water evaporating, but nobody's been ever to see those. We found an artifact for that. But uh, anyway, I hope that makes it clear. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, can you talk to us about yeah. the orientation of the water molecules at the oil water interface? Uh -huh. And you also talked about oil spills in the ocean. Yes. I'm curious if you study conditions like saltwater conditions or like uh -huh. ocean water samples with this, and if there's like there yeah, yeah, thanks for asking that question because what we've done is uh, uh, we're starting to do that with the nano emulsion studies, but we have done that with the, uh, these planar studies, dumped in a lot of salt, changing the acid conditions, and interestingly, what we find is that the anions uh, of the, the halide ions, for example, with salt, do go to the interface to some degree, more so than an air-water interface, which they don't go very much. But that's as close as we've gotten because, you know, it, Otherwise, it just gets really complicated. If you had ocean water, this water modes would blow up because you've got all kinds of junk that, that goes and uh, goes there. But your point is, is pertinent because as we, as we try to understand this, we keep in mind that we're really the fundamental studies. Then talking to people at BP um, who happen to be at this conference, they appreciate this because this isn't where they really under, understand it yet. But we're not to the level of being able to, and I don't think we ever will be able to get to the point of dumping in something that's more realistic um, conditions. But it also goes to the point that if we're going to if we're going to clean up these oil spills, we have to come up with this holy grail because it's this is not working uh, what we've got now, and it's amazing how many platforms in the Gulf people don't even know where they are that are that are dead at this point. So you have those that are just kind of sitting there emptying. Uh, and they don't even have them mapped on a map. Two, uh, but let me also say that when there is an oil spill globally, people around the world go to clean it up. I mean, there's a whole force of people that, that go to clean up oil spills. This is what they do. And thank God they do, because otherwise you'd be left to merely oil companies alone. Either not, I mean, I don't want to dump on the oil companies, but that, you, know, you have people that really understand the biology of cleanup and so forth, too. So it was a long answer your question. A good question. Uh-huh. Did you have a question? I yeah. did. Um, I'm just curious, how do you ensure in your, and you're, you, know, you didn't really show, you showed a graphic of your setup for the, uh, oh. for the vibrational uh -huh. spectroscopy, uh -huh. scattering spectroscopy. So, so, you know, this is a question that's totally based on my ignorance of your method. No, no, that's okay. It's okay. But I'm curious, how do you, how do you ensure that you're studying the oil wa water interface and not, say, the oil glass interface? Oh, yes. Yes. So we do all kinds of stuff to figure that out. But for the, for the, um, for the planar oil water interface, we're doing in a total internal reflection geometry. I didn't say that. And so that means that you really have it at the right angle to where it's going to be enhanced at that interface. Otherwise, you wouldn't get signal. But we always worry about that. Now, where your, your question is very relevant, even more relevant than, that, than what you just, I just told you, is for the nano droplet interface, because then you have a little cuvette, and then you're taking it in and you're looking at the scattered light, which could come from your cell, sure. right? And so in that case, what we do is, what we've been doing is using a calcium, just various windows that we can put there to make sure that it's not the windows of the cell, because we worked really hard to make sure that it wasn't, especially when we're getting this free OH, because the signal is, again, a signal only a mother could love. It's really tiny. And so we wanted to make sure that it wasn't coming from the cell uh, itself. So we really worry about that a lot. And so it's a, it's a relevant point. Good question. Uh-huh. Yeah, back there. Mm -hmm.
Is what? Yeah. Oh, yeah, but no, but we acid clean and then rinse it to get it neutral. Yeah, so we're still operating the nanomotion studies at a pH of 7. Yeah, no, but you raise a really important point. And that is so with, uh, um, with the planar studies, those are the ones where we've added the different uh, salts, but also acids and bases to try to understand largely how those water peaks, looking for different eigen uh, H3O plus. In that case, what you really have to worry about is sodium hydroxide because it's filthy. It's filthy. And so you re and it's really hard to clean up sodium hydroxide pellets. Uh, but they're really dirty. So getting them clean was getting the sodium hydroxide solutions clean was harder than, than we had anticipated. But with the acids, we, we actually, um, after we clean it up, we put the sample in and we make sure that we're sitting at a pH of 7. And then we've done a little bit of pH studies, uh, but not because the person that, Vidi, who's just such, done so beautiful work, not with some frequency, but doing, elect, uh, doing these um, zeta potential measurements. Uh, has done a whole series of pH to, to show that it's a hydroxide ion that gives you this minus 55 millivolts and negatively uh, charged. So, you know, the charge, it makes a big difference. And so he, what I was going to say, though, is he's done all the pH studies across the spectrum to, to uh, support that. Uh-huh. Yeah. For the nano emulsions? Uh, just kind of in general, I guess. Yeah, so we started with carbon tet because the beams, the infrared beam has to get through the oil for the total internal reflection geometry that I referred to. You got to get through the oil. And so to get through the oil, that's a lot of oil to get through. And if you've got a lot of CH modes that are going to suck up the, the IR, it's not going to make it to the interface to be able to measure a spectrum. But the, car the CCL4, uh, the carb you know, carbon chloride, carbon fluoride bonds are way down shifted, so you can get the IR beam through. So that's the reason for going to the carbon tet. Now, so, so now when we go to the other hexanes that we've been doing, in that case we've been using a very, very thin layer of oil so that we can get the IR beam through the, through the alkane and still have enough IR to get to the interface and then do corrections for the absorptions that's there. And so in that case we've been sticking with, you know, just very simple alkanes for that. For the nanomotion studies, we've chosen the oils that are most commonly used in nanomotions, that form stable nanomotions, because not all oils easily form stable nanomotions, particularly in this uh, region of, you know, that we're working in. And that's how we've chosen the oils in those cases. You can't really get carbon tet water uh, nanomotions to form without doing a significant surfactant there. So thanks for that question, too, because I didn't say that. Do you have another? What? Is that it? Yeah, okay. That Great. Thank you. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, this is related to another one of the other earlier questions. Um, is there a way to predict how different impurities in the water will affect the oil water in the place? Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, so what we did with our neat nanomotion study, so what we did with the planar studies is you can see when you have an impurity there that free OH goes away and the water bands blow way up blow way up because a charge goes there and the water bands blow way up. So you don't, you, you know that there's some, those impurities have a bit of a charge on them to create a field that's there, that's what we know. And then what we've done is we've added nanomotion, uh, nanomolar amounts of a surfactant to this, if this planar interface, and let me tell you what happens. What happens is you add nanomolar and you get this dip here and you start to get these bands to grow in. You don't see any of this in surface tension measurements. It's way lower than you would pick up. But then you see this dip grow in, and then with time, it grows to look like this. And then even with more time with surfactants, now you get to the micromolar, millimolar amount, and you lose the whole free OH, and the water bands look like this. <laughs> I mean, they're just enormous. And so what we're trying to do is simulate an impurity just to try to understand if you assume a simple surfactant like a sulfonate surfactant is like an impurity, which you know is a big what if, um, we can see what level of impurity would be there to have that kind of effect. And so that's what we've done with the, these neat nanomotions is we've actually been able to then add a trace amount of sulfonate there and reproduce all the some frequency data 
that was produced by the Roche group with these minus 50 millivolt nanomotions. Yeah. Uh huh. He's my great friend. He sp I spent time with him this afternoon. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I know. It's I, I know. <laughs> um, I'm really fascinated by this idea that the impurities just love to go to that interface. Whatever I mean, these amphiphilic impurities. Have you thought about potential applications for that? Finding like drug delivery, something like that. About what? Uh, potential applications for this concept that the impurities just like to be at that interface. No, no. I'll bet there are applications. I'll bet if we took some of the water that goes off your glass. Hey, we could look to see whether you've got impurities on it or not. I mean, yeah, you could measure how pure the water is by that concept. Well, actually, and in fact, what you see in the some frequency spectrum is three orders of magnitude more sensitivity than you would see from any other measurement technique, surface tension or anything else. And that's what's fooled people, because they're just using other techniques, and, and, but the spectroscopy is really sensitive to it. Any we'll start a company together, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> We're in. Well, you already got a job. <laughs> He's employed, by the way. Yeah, it's great. Other questions? Okay. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>